Welcome to episode 379 of the AMPM podcast. This week, my guest is Chris McKay from e-commerce Chris. And we're going to be talking about everything that everybody always has a lot of questions about. That's suspensions. And what do you do when Amazon slaps you on the back for either something you didn't do or something that you may have done and you're trying to solve the problem? Got some great insights in this episode with Chris for you. In the meantime, enjoy this episode with Mr. McCabe. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. We explore opportunities in e-commerce. We dream big and we discover what's working right now. Plus, plus, this is the podcast for Money Never Sleeps. Working around the clock in the AM and the PM. Are you ready for today's episode? I said, I said, are, are you, you ready? Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. Here's your host, Here's your host Kevin King. Kevin King. Chris McCabe, how you doing, man? So glad to finally have you on the podcast here. You've, you've spoken with Bradley and a few others before, but you and I have never done a podcast together. Hard to believe. It feels like I've been AM PMing for years, but this is our first, I guess. Well, for those of you that, that are listening that don't know who this guy is, he's one of the top experts when it comes to actually helping you when you get a problem with Amazon. And he actually used to actually work for the for the evil empire, right? And then you came to the good guy's side? That's right. The evil, the Darth Vader people. Um, seller performance. I used to work on that team. So what did, what did you actually do for seller performance? What what does that mean? When you does that mean that you were just reading these emails or were you overseeing a team of people and the, things got escalated up to you? Or what does that actually mean? I wasn't overseeing a team. The only time I oversaw work of other people were in training situations. When I had been there a few years and I had been promoted and I was um, looking at investigations, other seller performance people were doing and, you know, saying, yes, do that. No, don't do that. That kind of thing. It was mostly doing what people would probably guess, taking listings down, sending policy warnings, deleting listings that didn't belong, uh, suspending accounts, of course, reading appeals for reinstatement, deciding if the appeals were, you know, acceptable, justifiable for reinstatement and uh, sending denials, of course, if they weren't. So as time went on, I'd read more escalations. I wasn't doing that right, right away. The, the, you know, Jeff emails, so-called executive seller relations took me a couple of years to start working on those because back in the day you had to be certified and approved by your boss and maybe even your boss's boss to be able to handle those. It's not quite the way it's, uh, the way it's handled right now. So what years were this that you were at Amazon? So I started in 2006 in the A to Z guarantee claims, um, which was evaluating, you know, who, who's right, who's wrong, buyer or seller. Uh, sometimes Amazon would just pay claims themselves back in those days, trying to establish trust by buyers and sellers in the entire marketplace. Um, and then I moved to seller side in 2007, and I stuck with that for a good five, five and a half years up through 2012. So in 2012, what did, did you switch right into doing the, the, the consulting and the stuff you do now? Or was there something else you did in between starting up the, uh, the consulting yeah, company? I took time off is the short answer. Did a lot of world travel. Um, conventional wisdom back in those days was, you know, you kind of take a year off and then decide what you want to do or... Uh, when, I, when I did come back to the United States, I looked into working at some startups. I was living in Brooklyn. I was living in uh, New York. So I was looking at different startups. You know, could I contribute in other parts of e-commerce? One of the reasons we're called e-commerce Chris is because my original consulting concept was going to be all facets of e-commerce consulting. Uh, it just immediately went in the direction of help me with Amazon, help me with Amazon. You worked at Amazon for so long. You helped people with this sort of thing. When you worked there, you know, being an advocate for sellers on the other side of the fence, um, I would say it took three, four months for me to understand that I was going to be more of an Amazon consultant, not an all e-commerce consultant. So what year was this? Uh, so 2012, 2013, the rest of 2012 and 2013, I wasn't really working on much of anything. I was traveling. Uh, 2014 is when I started consulting and 2015 is when I created the e-commerce Chris LLC. So I'd always think it's actually, you know, I, I get, got into some IRS trouble uh, about 20 some odd years ago where uh, I didn't actually, 
you know, I was growing my uh, growing a company and it's about 25 years ago now, I guess, Grow, growing a company. And instead of, you know, as you take money out of a uh, the employee's paycheck, you're supposed to give that to the IRS and you know, you match that. I wasn't doing that. I was actually using that to cash flow, and the IRS uh, sees that as stealing. And basically it is, um, you know, cause they're, they're filing a return uh, and getting a refund and I haven't paid it yet, but I was cash flow. And it's like, I always like, I'll catch it up. I'll catch it up. I'll catch it up. I was just robbing Peter to pay Paul. And it, the, the house of cards came crashing down on me and I had to actually go to somebody and they call it with the IRS, a registered agent. And that's, that's someone, oftentimes, those people actually used to work on the other side at the IRS, and they were going after people to collecting money. Then they retire or get tired of the, the working for the government or whatever, and they, they flip to the other side, and they're not, now, I know how the inner workings work. I know exactly what to do. Now, let me help you. Mm-hmm. And so I found a guy like this, and I think I owed, like, I don't know, 200, it was like, it was about 80 grand or something originally, 60 or 80 grand originally. But with penalties and interest and all the the stuff, it it was over two hundred thousand bucks. That's oh, a good chunk of and change. This I went to this. It was a chunk of change. Mm-hmm. And I went to this guy. I said, "What do I do?" And he's like, "Look, how long has it been since they contacted you?" I said, "Well, I had a, an offer and compromise, and I did this, and and it's been like seven years." And he said, "Holy cow, it's been seven years." He said, "You didn't hear this from me, but somehow you fell in through the system. Mm-hmm. You need to just lay low." Uh, just lay low, you know, don't open a bigger bank account. Don't go buy a house. Don't do anything. Just, just lay low. And there's a rule. He knew all the internal rules. Like it, I think it was at 10 years, actually, maybe it'd been eight or nine. It was cause I only had to wait like a year and, and then he fills out some form, s- sent it over to, to them. And the whole thing got dismissed. I never had to pay a dime of it. The entire thing. It's on my record, so I can talk freely about yep. it now. Like they can't come knocking on my door if someone's listening to this and say we want that. Um, it, it, but he knew how to do it, and I think that's something that's important to note here with Ecom Chris versus a lot of these other people. Is like, yeah, things might have been a little bit different back. You know, that was eight years ago, or ten years ago that you worked there, a little over. Mm-hmm. But still, the same principles. A lot of the same foundations are still the same, and the fact that you were there on the other side going after people and now you're helping people, you understand it better than like the other 100 companies and consultants that are trying to do this, I believe. Do you, do you think there's a lot of credibility or validity to yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we all, my whole team have had to stay current, obviously. We're not using antiquated knowledge to approach some of these strategies, but the core themes and, and Amazon's view of the marketplace hasn't changed that much when you talk about enforcement, when you talk about suspensions, what's justifiable, what's not. The communication is something that's changed a little bit. Um, I would have kind of passed out on my feet if I saw messages going out in those days that read like today's messages because <laughs> because I would not want to be associated with communication that is that opaque and gray and murky and just so non-communicative messaging, I think, is nothing to be proud So it wasn't of. that way back when you were there? It wasn't these very vague, like, figure out, you did something wrong, you figure out and you tell us what you did wrong, we're not going to tell you? It wasn't that way in the, back when you were there? Well, all I can say is I thought, I thought it was bad back then, never knowing that we would inhabit this universe we're in now, which is just, there's no point sending this message. This message says nothing. Um, you can read through the the lines, you can read the tea leaves a little bit and figure out if it's a yes or a no, because if they tell you you're reinstated, well, I mean, you don't need much information after that. If they don't mention the word reinstatement, I guess you can figure out you've been rejected. So how do they train people? Like when you went in, uh, I may be different, a little bit different now, but how do they, they just throw you to the fire and say, these are the SOPs, look, try to match this up. Or is there, because a lot of the people that are doing this, they have no clue about the other side. They don't know yeah. what it's like to be a seller or what it's like to you know, that their whole livelihoods on the line here or they're oh. supporting an office of 50 people. So how do they, how is the actual training or is it just, there's just too much to know. And that's why, like you said, that's why it's so generic. There's a lot to know. There's more to know now than when I was being trained. I had, I had really good training. Um, I think I kind of got lucky. Uh, one of the people that trained me back in the day, you know, works with us now. So, you know, obviously he knew what he was talking about. And I kind of got lucky that I was rubbing elbows with him. Um, I had some other people who ended up working 10, 15, 17 years at Amazon who also trained me back, back in those days. So they don't really have, I mean, they do have veterans who stay that long. Um, It's increasing, increasingly rare, 
but there are people who stay with the company a long time, but those are like S team executives, people at the higher echelons of the company. Um, these days people move on a little quicker. Don't they have a KPI? They have to right. hit so many per hour or something like that. So they don't, they can't spend a lot of time yeah. on each one. Same in Southern. Do you know what that, do you know what that number is or have a rough idea I mean, of what that might be? Not for support. For seller performance, I had to get through, I don't know, 13 and a half, 14, 15 of them an hour. Oh, wow. Yeah. I kind of was lucky in some ways because A, I had wonderful training by people who had been there like a decade before they even met me, who had been there at the beginning of the marketplace. Um, I think they understood some of my strengths I didn't have a lot of e-commerce experience, but I had fraud prevention, fraud investigation experience from other companies. And they kind of knew my strengths and weaknesses and they knew where they had to devote their time with me. Um, but we also had managers who understood like, hey, this is one to learn from. This is a use case that a couple of us didn't quite understand. We know we're going to get 200 of these over the next 10 days. We're going to talk about it in the team meeting, take it apart, analyze it. Um, it was before the marketplace became so rush, rush, rush. Let's just make sure we get through the day. Let's just make sure we throw bodies at a problem without knowing if it's the right bodies or if they know how to solve that problem. Well, speaking of those bodies, where does, where does it start when someone, when I, I get a performance notification or, or if I just happen to open up a case about something, mm-hmm. the first level is pretty much based in India for the most part, right? Yeah, I mean, with the work that we do, with the kinds of appeals we have to work on, the kinds of brand registry, whatever, Marine State Nascent troubleshooting we do, we don't work with the case system much. The case system for support is primarily like account compromises, technical issues, um, you know, there's a glitch with my image. Can you get me to the catalog teams? Very, very specific stuff. We don't rely on or use the case system with any of our clients for any major league impact, you know, I'm losing thousands of dollars a day, my ASIN's down, or appeals stuff. Um, And we try not to rely on anything we're hearing from the account health reps either. I mean, occasionally, yes. But um, the case system, lion's share of that is in uh, Hyderabad. But technically, those are global teams, you know, to keep keep it 24 hours. Um, is it true there's a team like there is a team in what South Dakota that and a team yeah. in Costa Rica? You hear these things like, oh, yeah. you try to speak Spanish and you'll get directed to the Costa there's Rica some team. Of that. A little bit I mean, smarter. But call during these business hours, you might get the South Dakota team yeah. and talk to a, a Western person. So there is some truth to some of that uh, as well. Yeah. Well, Costa Rica, there are also some um, strategic account managers there, SAS Core. Um, it changes over time. There used to be no account managers in Costa Rica. Now there's several, you know. Um, so when it's performance based is like what you're said, you're, you guys are dealing with, is that mostly people for someone selling in the U S market? Is that mostly you're dealing with someone based here in the United States? We deal more with the account health teams than support. So if we're talking about account that's, health services, that's what I meant to say. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. Sorry, so for, sorry. That's fine. So for account health services calling later, and those are global too. You can easily get someone in India as most sellers hearing this can, can attest to. You want to call later in the day to minimize the chances you get somebody in India for account health. I've gotten to the point and, you know, I've listened in on and participated in, I don't know, thousands of those calls at this point over the last few years. Um, we've gotten to the point where we just tell people, if you get somebody in India, hang up and call back for account health issues because you might get generic information. You might get them reading from a script. You might get misinformation, wrong information that will only hurt you, not help. It's one thing if you don't get any help, but if you get negative help, that's even worse when you're talking about an appeal. Um, I have had some India reps that I've quizzed and talked to who knew their stuff cold and they were good, but those are so few and far between, you can't count on that. And if you're going to be on a 10, 12, 14 minute call, some people are on 40 minute calls, um, you need to make sure you up the odds that you're talking to somebody who at least has a chance of knowing what they're talking about. So East Coast time, call later in the day. Um, if you're on Pacific time, you know, try to call mid afternoon, I guess, something like that, um, to increase the odds that you don't get a rep who's based in India, because I just don't think they're reliable enough. There are some U S reps that aren't reliable for other reasons, but your odds of getting usable info improve. And when I say usable info, I'm talking about somebody you had an appeal denied, You don't want a pat on the back. You don't want their coaching. You don't want their generic generic plan of action advice. You need to know one thing, which you should be able to find out within two minutes whether or not they're going to tell you. 
not 10 or 20 minutes. Why was it denied? Yeah, that's happened to me sometimes where yeah. I get an email, you know, we had this problem when we were selling hand sanitizer yeah. in 2020 and I had a business rep from business development. He was in charge of, he was business development for travel or something. <laughs> okay. And when COVID hit, he got moved over to the COVID store and was in charge of like the whole COVID store. They had set up this special COVID store mm -hmm. and we were hundred percent approved all the way up the ladder to legal signing off on our labels at Amazon, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. But we were constantly, 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 constantly shut down on our listing. And I, and, but I had his speed number. I had his phone number. I had his home phone number. He's like, call me anytime. It doesn't matter. And he was on our side and he was going to bat. This guy was like, look, this is the, this is the type of client that we want on our, on our, on our platform. They are doing true branding. They're not fly by night. Mm -hmm. They're FDA. They're all this quit effing with them, mm -hmm. quit fucking with them. And, and, the system kept doing us like, isn't there a toggle you can switch that says, leave them alone? He's like, unfortunately, there's not. I said, yeah, there is. Nike doesn't go through this shit. <laughs> um, there is a secret button somewhere, you know, but you know, most of us don't have access to that. We, we used to. So this is an important thing to answer your old question about how did we view sellers, you know, 10 years ago or something. We did consider how long they had been on the platform. I don't think anyone thinks about that or cares about that anymore. We did look at their revenue level. Have they responsibly shown they can sell 10, 12, 14 million a year? And they haven't really created headaches for buyers, for Amazon, for other sellers. That should be a, a point in their favor. And this has just gotten lost along the way. It's kind of lost in the background noise. I think they pay lip service to it, but they don't make business decisions that make sense anymore that are logical to the rest of us who have been in business for as long as we have. Because somewhere along the way, they got tunnel vision with like certain elements of an SOP and they forgot about, is this a trustworthy seller or not? You know, I think some of that is branding though. They're going to do that with Nike or with a big national international brand. Mm -hmm. But if you're XYZ Chinese seller with some strange brand name, and you, even if you're doing a hundred million dollars a year on their platform, um, they don't. I don't think they really give a shit because if they knock that guy, if they take you off uh, and you might've been doing something you shouldn't have been doing, maybe you deserve to come off. Right. But if they take you off, there's 26 others waiting to take your place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you're not Nike and you're not going to go out to the press. You might complain to the Chinese press. Like some of those did a couple of years ago when they took a bunch of big ones. 50,000 accounts went down. Yeah. Some multi billions dollars worth of revenue. Right. But Amazon didn't miss a beat, didn't miss a lick. Uh, there's some other people just took their place. And a lot of those guys are right back under a different name. Oh, of course. Or in different whatever. Lightly they rebranded. <laughs> yeah, they, they just, yeah, most of those are all back. Yeah. That's a problem. And, and I don't know how you fix that when you're as big as, as, as they are. Um, and and that's, that's where we need people like you that are advocating uh, for us. So what, what are you seeing that's like, what's something that people shouldn't, a couple things here. What are some people, people come to you, they, you get a call at midnight one night. Oh my God, my account's down. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing 80 grand a day. Help me, help me, help me. Uh, probably frantic people. And, mm -hmm. and you look into it and they're actually doing something they shouldn't be doing. They claim they're not, but they actually are. What are some of the things you see there? And then we'll take it from there to the flip side. Is like, what are some of the things that you see that Amazon thinks people are doing and they're not doing? They're totally innocent that they get problems with. What are a couple examples that you are seeing over and over and what are some advice you may have on how people can sellers can deal with this stuff. Yeah. And of course, um, suspensions of accounts, if we are just talking mainly about accounts right now are trendy, right? There are things that Amazon's willing to do in August, September, and even October that they won't necessarily do in November and December when things are really kicking, you know, they'll kind of back off for a while. Um, historically they've done that in Q4, but Related accounts are the ones where we see all the head scratching. They're still kind of, after all these years, after all these tool improvements, SOP improvements, so-called, we're still amazed at some of the ridiculous investigations they do where they conclude that two accounts are related, even if they haven't really had any data points that align between them for like four years. You know, you could probably almost guess that maybe it's just you know, like a service provider that they were using four years ago that maybe they share with another account or, I mean, they just don't make intelligent business decisions. So when related accounts though, like I have, like yeah. there used to be a, a thing about people say, don't always log in from a VPN and, and never, you know, never log in when you're traveling or, or something like that. And because you, if you have multiple accounts that they're going to tie them together, I have five different 
you know, seller central accounts. Mm-hmm. Two of them are not active, but three of them are active. Um, I don't have a problem switching around between them. Service providers don't have a problem switching around between them. But I did seven or eight years ago. I was one of my companies. I was buying a lot of hard drives, mm-hmm. and and the hard drives um, I could get them back then for like thirty nine bucks. And I was I was using putting data on them and then reselling them for like four hundred bucks. I was right. it was a it was a service where I would load it up with a bunch of a data and then sell it as a a package instead of downloading it from the internet mm-hmm. and. Uh, you were limited to buy like 10 per account or something, you know, people had limits on. So I just had multiple accounts and they figured that out and they shut my other accounts down. Um, but what is it that they're looking for when, what, what is a related account? I thought it was always like, if you're selling the same thing, if you're trying to sell. Well, that's multiple accounts. So related accounts, okay. I mean like being related to a suspended account. Oh, oh okay, and a lot okay, of the okay. ones related, that okay. we work on, I mean, I, I, okay, so like if I get, I have three account, my three accounts. If I, I got suspended on one of them, mm-hmm. they may put two and two together. And say oh, this is the same guy that's running yeah. these other two. Okay, it's okay, not that's just IP okay, address. Okay. If they, if they just see an IP address in common, then they're probably taking treating it like it's a strong relation, but it's actually a weak relation if it's IP only. Um, but generally speaking, sometimes they're just not using logic, and they're not using timelines in terms of, oh, there's a relationship between these two accounts. I mean, I don't know. Are they signing into the same two accounts from the same computer every day? Yeah, that sounds like a strong relationship. Was it four years apart? Maybe not a strong relationship. Somewhere along the way, the logic behind relating accounts, because obviously they don't want people getting suspended, evading that suspension by just creating another account. That's the intention. Yeah, right. That's the intention of the policy. And I think most people can understand that it's it's pretty logical. Um, and then of course, if it's like, well, a family member, you know, sometimes you try to argue, well, it's, that's my uncle. That's not me, but Amazon doesn't know whether it's you or your uncle and they don't care. It looks like you got somebody else to start an account for you and you're selling the Mm -hmm. same stuff for the same brand or from the same address, the same location and so forth. It's not a convincing argument, but there's a lot of screwy decisions being made where accounts are clearly not related. Our heart goes out to the people who get stuck trying to appeal that stuff. Fairly simple, straightforward. Amazon doesn't want to hear it. Amazon rejects the appeals. Amazon won't say why it's being rejected, all that ridiculous stuff. When we have to intervene and get their escalations going for something that they really probably didn't or shouldn't need us to do. I mean, related accounts is one of the things that's kind of just, why are we still so far in the dark ages on how this can be, how this information can be evaluated. This is not the early days of the marketplace. This is not 2011 or 2008. It's like, what's going on? Why can't we get past this seemingly easy hurdle? The things that you were saying in terms of things sellers are still doing to get themselves into trouble. I mean, it's cyclical, you know, it's trendy. Sometimes Amazon forgets about product review abuse for nine months at a time. And then all of a sudden they're, hot and heavy on it. But those are things that I think some sellers think that just because they haven't heard that there's been a mass purge of suspensions, they think that maybe Amazon doesn't care about that, whatever it is, that kind of compliance anymore. And they either go back to something they were doing before and they get reprimanded for that or that caught again for it. Um, Or they just assume like, well, Amazon's so busy and I haven't heard about it. So maybe they're just finished with that. They're not going to suspend people for that anymore. Or again, using the example of reviews abuse, they think in turn, they, they forget that hiring a third party service or a, or a consultant or a marketing company, whatever, you're on the hook for whatever they do on your behalf. If they do something non-compliant, you can't go to Amazon and say, oh, I found them on the service provider network that you guys have. So I'm not responsible for what they did. They're responsible. You can't finger point. You're still on the hook for it. Or if you just went on their website or had a phone call with them and you said, hey, do you follow Amazon's rules? Are you TOS compliant? If they just say, oh yeah, we are, or they put something on their website, that doesn't really mean anything to Amazon. Amazon doesn't care. They care about whether you are following the rules because the buck stops with you. You pay the ultimate price if something they were doing gets you suspended. Now, back in the day, like a couple of years ago, you could squirm out of that by saying, look, we fired them. Um, we, we can document when we terminated them. We don't work with them anymore. We understand everything they do that or were doing that was wrong. These are the fixes we have in place. These are our pre- preventative measures. You could neatly 
lay that out in your plan of action and Amazon would take it. The problem is, especially as we saw in Q4 recently, um, they're much less tolerant of that kind of, they see that more of an excuse now, not an explanation or not a justification. Now they come back and say, oh, you know what? We've seen a bunch of you that we've had to suspend because you worked with this company. Tell us more about them. We're not interested in you anymore. Maybe we'll give you a chance to come back. Maybe we won't. We want to go after those guys and we're going to use you to do it. So they kind of turn, turn you into like a stool pigeon of sorts. And they're trying to address, they're trying to attack the problem at the source, right? Amazon used to have no relationship to Facebook, no relationship to groups on Facebook that helped people fake reviews. Now they work with Facebook directly. Well, how did that happen? Well, they decided they wanted to attack the problem at the source. And they realized that a lot of the Facebook groups were responsible for it. Well, they can't punish Facebook. They have to go to Facebook, work with them to identify who's behind the groups, get them in the court, sue them, get them out of business or whatever. They're using the sellers as human shields to get to the people who are promoting the bad practices. That is not something they were doing two years ago. That's something we've seen. It's not just Meta though, right? Yeah. Don't, don't they have a oh, relationship sure. with pay, PayPal now yeah. and a few of the, several of the others too, right? I think it started with Meta though. I don't remember them. Yeah. Um, and I am by no means taking credit for this, but I was one of the people two, three years ago who was kind of banging my fist on the table. Why is Amazon not working with another giant tech company like Facebook to help solve some of this out? Because um, I think I was quoted in a couple articles about it. So I can go back and <laughs> prove that I talked about it then. The bottom line is somebody heard it. Somebody took action. Somebody decided we're treating the symptom, not the disease. Well, what's the disease? The disease is sellers need sales rank. Sellers need positive reviews. Some of them don't know good ways of getting them or they're not willing to wait for, you know, positive experiences from buyers to play itself out. They want to take a shortcut. So, I mean, some progress is made with this stuff. The message for sellers, anyone listening to this is be careful who you work with. Be careful. I mean, first of all, you don't want to pay somebody for service only to have them get you in trouble and get your account suspended. I mean, that's a really a nasty experience to go through. Second, what about all the search find buy companies? You know, that was a hot thing for about two years. And then Amazon kind of a little over a year ago kind of said, Hey, this is not allowed anymore. It still exists. They're just not as out there as much, but and those companies would always say, we've never had a single one of our people. Uh, we don't know what you're talking about. We've never had a single one of our people uh, suspended for us doing a search find buy. And for those that don't know what search find buy is, there were services, uh, you know, there's some that were legitimate like rebate services, but there was a there was a side of like rebate key, and there was others that were just straight up. You pay us fifteen dollars. We got somebody. We have a Facebook group, or we have a Manny Chat group, or we have a group of people, moms, that will go and buy your product. You give us fifteen dollars as a service fee, or sometimes more than that, depending on supplements, and and you give us whatever the price of your product is, if it's 20 bucks or whatever. So you pay us $35. We'll get these people to go buy your product, search for whatever keywords you want. Mm -hmm. So you rank and then write reviews uh, on them. And yep. that got cracked down on. It still exists, but how big of an issue was that? Did you see a lot of people getting suspended oh, yeah. back then? And do you see that still continuing now off of that? Well, I mean, First point is the service or the company that you pay can disappear. They can declare bankruptcy, maybe, mm -hmm. or, or their business dries up and they made a nice score of money for a couple of years. And then they move on to something else. Like no one pays them for, you know, they get a bad rep. Nobody pays them anymore. There are no consequences, of course, and they move on. Nowadays, it's a little bit different because the FTC is very involved in this stuff. This is one reason why Amazon's chasing the companies and the service providers themselves because the FTC started going after some of these companies and suing them or outing them or whatever, because it was obvious that they were just helping fake online reviews, which is a, a form of fraud, which is against the law. And it's hurting consumers, right? The FTC has to take an interest in that. So we did see a lot of sellers getting busted. I would say it was, they were overly trusting. You know, they went to an event, they went, they joined a group, and word of mouth told them, hey, I got a bunch of reviews from so-and-so. And they were just kind of riding along on the say-so of another seller or maybe even a service provider or a consultant. And maybe they didn't ask the consultant, hey, are you getting a piece of this action to recommend these guys? Is there a reason why you're so pro 
you know, promoting these, these types of services because it seems like they're a little shady, a little iffy. People weren't really doing due diligence. They were overly trusting, maybe a little bit gullible. And it's like, again, whichever consultant you're believing or whichever seller you're talking to, maybe that other seller is doing the same thing you're doing. You'll be suspended and they won't be suspended. I mean, enforcement at Amazon is very, very inconsistent. There are people out there doing exactly what you're doing. You get in tons of trouble and they get a policy warning or they get like some mm-hmm. quickie call from account health saying, ah, we need you to write a quick plan of action in 72 hours and ah, include a couple of these things in it and tell us what we want to hear and then we'll go away. Sometimes they will go away. Obviously, if it gets rejected, they won't go away and they'll suspend you too but it's all over the place. Some people run through the raindrops and never get wet. And that's just the way it goes. I mean, what happens to one seller doesn't always happen to another. They could be using the same playbook. So what are you seeing? One of the big topics out there is inserts lately. And you know, there is some people that do manipulation on inserts where they'll put an insert in and they'll say, if you, if you like the product, go leave us a five-star review at this link on Amazon. If you don't like it, email us. Or there used to be old ways, you know, where we would back in you know 2016, there was a tactic where we'd say, if you like the product, leave a review, right. click this link. If you don't like it, click this link. It would go to seller feedback because we know we could get those removed. And yep. All those things Amazon does not like. There's no question about that type of stuff or putting five stars down at the bottom of your insert saying, leave us a re- an objective review, but there's five stars that look like it's Amazon on the bottom. You should not be doing any of that. But some people are also saying now that you should not be putting directing anything off of Amazon. And I know that's the fact on Amazon. Like if you're on Amazon or doing the email correspondence with uh, a customer, Mm -hmm. you should not be directing them to your website. You should not show your URL and your product packaging, your photos or anything like that. But in a package insert, if I've got a package insert and I say, go to my site to get a warranty or go to my site, I've got all the accessories for this product. Or um, if you join my VIP club, you know, uh, on our Shopify site, you get this. There's a lot of people that are saying, don't do that. That's against the terms of service. You'll get in trouble. And I'm of the opinion that even though Amazon's wording may be able to be interpreted that way, mm-hmm. that's not the intent of it. And that's not what they're going after uh, because big brands do that all the time. They, they, I mean, every they have inserts. Um, when you buy a new Sony yeah. key, keyboard, it has an insert. It's totally fine. But there's a lot of gurus in our space that are saying, don't ever do that. Don't ever do send them anywhere else uh, except back to Amazon and insert. Can you clarify what you've seen uh, on, on that just so people can hear it from someone that's probably dealt with some of these kinds of issues? Yeah, it depends on what's on the insert, of course. Um, no one said every insert is the worst thing in the world. Um, I think there was anxiety and panic around inserts for a while because of the number, the sheer number of suspensions and people forgot about is one insert different from another. A while ago, having five stars at at the top of the insert didn't really mean much. Now it means everything. I mean, you can definitely get suspended just for that. We can, we can say that's nitpicky and petty. Um, Amazon thinks you're tipping the scales by having the five star. You're encouraging a five star. You're You're psychologically influencing. I mean, the, Contact us if you have a problem. If you're happy, leave a review. That went out a long time ago because so many people got suspended for doing that. No one's willing to do that anymore. I still see it occasionally, but very infrequently. The warranty stuff went away because people weren't just redirecting buyers for warranty purposes. They were mixing in other language, other messaging that talked about discounts, that talked about special offers or they sent you to a page on their website that mentioned a warranty, but also mentioned other stuff, you know, that's where the warranty stuff got tricky and it kind of polluted the whole warranty conversation to the point where now Amazon's just heavily suspicious of the use of the word warranty on inserts, just because of so many bad experiences with so many sellers who are trying to use that as a gateway to other things. And sellers were, I mean, you know, just as as well as I do, sellers were trying to kind of use the warranty to open this wide variety of conversations with buyers and direct them over here. I mean, QR codes, really, it it takes you somewhere else, but it's not just that you're going somewhere else. It's what do you see when you get there? What's on that that landing page? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have an insert in my, I I sell calendars on on Amazon seasonal. I've been doing it for 20 some odd years. It's one of my, my product lines. I have an insert in every single calendar on Amazon. It says, congratulations, you've won a free calendar. 
just pay $10 shipping and handling. You get a random calendar and I get rid of my excess stock, my excess stuff that way. There's nothing about reviews. There's nothing about a warranty. There's nothing that says go to the website and buy it or send us a check money or in the mail and we'll send it to you. And it's a, it, it pays for itself and I get name, I get leads off of it. I've never had an issue with that, but I'm not doing anything around warranties or, or ratings or reviews or anything to that nature. The word free, use of the word free is not risk-free. <laughs> um, it doesn't actually, the biggest misconception to answer your question in a different way that we saw in Q4 just now and then that we see ahead in 2024 is do not assume that just because you're not asking for a review that you're okay to give product away or heavily discount product. That's not true. If you net or create a cluster of positive reviews because you're giving product away, Amazon will probably start the investigation by identifying that data cluster, but they will enforce that. They will take action on it because you're not supposed to give product away. They assume that you know that if you give product away, you will have a net positive of reviews, which is considered tipping the scales. What's well, free? Mine, in my case, it's free plus shipping. You're paying 10 bucks. I get so that, but there, yeah. there are a lot of people offering freebies. Yeah. Exactly. And free, then they come back a week later or a month later and say, Hey, uh, right. hope you like that. You know, please leave us a review. There's a review. There's a review mention or they view it as compensation though. I just want to, I mean, it's not that you're paying people to leave you five star reviews, which is considered, you know, terrible. And of, and of course something they enforce, this is considered an incentive by Amazon policy enforcement. PRA product review abuse teams. I'm not worried about yeah. it because I'm not doing anything. Uh, on that side. And if they ever, somebody, somebody ever came and I've never done anything black hat mm. at all. Um, I like to know what the hell is going on. You know, I've been to meetings of uh, where there's 20 black hat, right. the most black hat people in the building that you've ever <laughs> seen in this, in this thing. I'm like, my eyes and my ears are open. I'm like, my mind is blown mm -hmm. on what they're doing. I'm like, holy cow, how do you have all these SOPs? And how do you know exactly what the limit is? Don't do, you know, 13 is a threshold. Don't go to 14 right. on whatever it may be. Um, they have it all down. Um, well, those people had Amazon SOPs. They were just paying bribes to employees to get internal info, right? Yeah, yeah. They had, I mean, they we, had, we know what was happening now from the guilty pleas and the indictments from last year. Yeah, there's been some big indictments and some big things that have, that have come yeah. down uh, on that. And I think even one of the people that was indicted basically. Said, uh, F you. Uh, um, but it, <laughs> Went it's a uh, or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, there's one in that big case that's still in India that they can't find. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, but international yeah, there's, there's fugitives, more, more fact of life. But it's not so much that you are going to get in trouble. It's that somebody who's gunning for you might make a report. A couple of years ago, nobody was even knew there were abuse prevention teams, let alone that you could report abuse. Now it's common. So that where it's coming out, is that where that it's, how does Amazon, if I got it, let's go back to the insert thing. If I'm putting my insert in there and yeah. it's saying, get a free bottle of uh, my supplement for, you know, in exchange for review or whatever, is Amazon in their warehouse randomly just opening this stuff up to see okay. what you're doing? Or is it they randomly looking at the reviews where someone put a picture of it and talked about it and they're just catching those words? Or is it somebody actually report a competitor most likely? Both. Report tattletelling on you. Um, what, where are these leads coming from? I mean, most people that are reporting the abuse, they're buying from competitors. If you're making a valid report, you can buy from a competitor. It's not just straight up, you know, nefarious anti-competitive behavior. They take a picture of the insert and they send the picture to abuse prevention teams. I know people have done that and it just goes on deaf ears. Um, they're probably doing it just by opening seller support cases or doing, you know, first rung of the ladder stuff. And that will often fall on deaf ears. It's unfortunate that happens, but people who understand how to escalate this stuff, it won't fall on deaf ears. And they'll put the abuse prevention teams in position to take action on those accounts because they can go. I mean, you know, most, most of our clients at least are 100% FBA. They can just go open up your inventory and look at the insert themselves. I mean, it's not that difficult the people who are reading your the abuse report aren't the ones opening it, but obviously they can do it internally. So what's the way to do that? Is, is there, I know there's some links that are like abuse at this and abuse at that, but the abuse probably gets abused. 
I mean, it gets abu- they, they're not going to take action if it's not a valid abuse report, if it looks like you're just sniping at somebody. Um, we've had people, we've heard of cases where they faked what the insert was, like through Photoshop, or they tried to make it look, well, they could say, like, here's our order. You know, there's a real order number, but the insert wasn't the one that was in there. They might have monkeyed with it or something. And maybe the person that opened the package and looked at the insert didn't notice that it wasn't quite the same thing. Um, so, I mean, that has happened, but if it's a valid abuse report, yeah, they're going to take action. If they think your inserts are resulting in an unfair competitive advantage, you versus your competitor, or if they think you're deceiving buyers, negatively impacting buyer experience in any way, or if they think you're creating risk and problems for Amazon itself. I mean, Amazon's under the microscope right now. You know, there's a reason why you keep reading articles or hearing about FTC and Amazon in the same sentence. Um, this is a big deal. The FTC has been cracking down. I think it was 2018 was the first time they came out with, Hey, there's a lot of artificially inflated product reviews on Amazon, or there's a lot of reviews yeah. abuse on Amazon. It's been, you know, you're talking five, six years at this point. So that's not that's even yeah, I remember 2016, yeah. October 3rd, 2016 yeah. was D-Day. And this that was back when... Uh, <laughs> you remember the exact day. day. I'm very impressed. I remember that day, just like Pearl Harbor Day, or that yeah. was that was the death day for Amazon sellers because on that day, Amazon said no more incentivized reviews because in the old days, it was no problem. Give the product away for free or for a penny or whatever. Right. And and as long as someone put a disclaimer in the review that they got this and this review is in exchange for their honest opinion for a product... You're totally fine. And then the FTC came down and um, yeah, that went away overnight. Yeah, but it, that's a good point you make about the honest review. Um, that used to irritate the hell out of me because if it's incentivized, it's by definition no longer honest. Right, right. right. So the idea <laughs> that like, well, we did incentivize, but we only asked for an honest review. I was so grateful when that whole thing went away and it doesn't really come up anymore because that never no. made sense to begin with. And Amazon should have shut that down a long time. And they wiped a ton of reviews away too off of that. Yeah. You, you know, what's mentioned, what's worth mentioning about review wipes is they over wipe reviews. Sometimes they send emails. We're working with some brands who had a couple of ASINs where gray area, you know, there was heavy enforcement by Amazon pr- abuse prevention teams. It was kind of a border borderline case. But they said, well, we're going to take your reviews away for a couple of and then they ended up deleting them all. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of fact checking in terms or double checking in terms of, did we take away too many of the seller's reviews? We end up doing appeals for people like, hey, remember this message you sent us? It's right here. <laughs> you mentioned one ASIN. You deleted all the reviews for all these other ASINs. Do you have a reason for that? Do you have an explanation for that? And they were calling into account health or, you know, emailing executive seller relations or whatever and the messaging coming back from Amazon was kind of like, uh, I don't know. We'll go look into that. And then they would never get back to them or, or they would restore the reviews. We saw lots of crazy stuff in Q4 like that, where it was just like, oh, they overstepped their, the bounds of their enforcement. Maybe no Sometimes one was watching reviews them. reviews mysteriously <laughs> show back up too. Sometimes they pop back up. I mean, there are yeah. some people that hire us to report reviews abuse and Amazon takes them down for a day or two and then they pop back up. And we have to do it again. Amazon never explains. How does that pop back up? Someone just overrides somebody? Good question. Uh, How does that pop back up? <laughs> Lots of interesting uh, internal questions, I think, around how sometimes that happens. But another big thing well, that's happened since I left and in, in the years since the indictment, which was in 2020 for consultants and service providers who were found to be paying bribes to employees to whether whether it was reinstate seller accounts that were suspended or attack one brand on beh- at the behest of another brand. Amazon was forced to silo their teams even more than they already had. They were already internally commuting poor- communicating poorly with each other. They were already very siloed. Amazon's famous for this, both inside the company and outside. They had to silo everyone even further and limit their access to certain kinds of information. Like account managers complain about this all the time. You mentioned earlier the account manager who showed the seller a copy of an internal message because mm-hmm. they were so fed up and frustrated. Well, account managers are increasingly dragged into the fray for why is this happening to me? Am I being attacked by a competitor? Is an employee at Amazon doing something they shouldn't be doing against me? Well, Amazon had to keep account managers away from certain kinds of information because some account managers were being incentivized externally by other you know, illicit 
factors and players from sharing info that they shouldn't have been sharing. And not just account managers. I don't mean to throw the SAS teams under the bus. There were lots of people working at Amazon who were doing things they weren't supposed to be doing, financially incentivized or otherwise. So Amazon had to limit their access and keep their eyeballs away from competitor information or sales reports that they shouldn't have been viewing. One of the things I always wondered was, you know, when a lot of these these cases came down, these like the 2021, some of the others, a lot of the data, you know, back when the brokers were actually selling, you know, you could get PPC reports and all kinds of stuff before Amazon starts showing, you know, they're, they're revealing more of that now with brand analytics and some of the different reports because they almost had to. Um, but used to, you had to pay for that from someone on the inside. And that was always coming out of India or China. Why did the people, I never understood, why did the people in India or China have access to U.S. stuff? Shouldn't that have been siloed that That's a mis- U.S. is U.S. only and yeah. India is India only or something like well, that? Well, the India teams, I mean, a lot of marketplace management, seller performance and beyond um, happens uh, in India. <laughs> Several teams were slowly, gradually um, shifted over there over the years. That started when I was still there, actually. Um, but there's a misconception that this was all coming out of India and China. A lot of it was, but there was plenty of it happening with Seattle based teams too. And that was in the indictment. I mean, I don't know how many people sat down and read either the 38 page initial indictment or this, the sentencing that was this year or the guilty pleas and everything in between. It was clear that there were Seattle people involved. Those are, those are financial crimes committed on us soil. And that's why the U.S. attorney's offices were getting involved to an extent. Maybe they can get involved in things that are happening with overseas employees of a U.S.-based company, but that's a lot harder to take action on. And um, I mean, a lot of employees were simply terminated. They weren't really prosecuted for doing this, which is another thing a lot of people in the general public don't understand that maybe one or two employees were, you know, given a prison sentence, but not really. I mean, you're talking about hundreds to low thousands of employees globally minimum involved in this stuff. So well, there's a big one. They made a case of uh, back in the last summer. Was it in, in Atlanta or something? There was. Yeah. Well, that's that- a case. I mean, there are other employees who are just simply stealing from the company, which has nothing to do with marketplace sellers or third party sellers. Yeah. There have been some employees that just rerouted returns and money into their own pockets. That was uh, those people. Those people got long sentences, I think. Um, what was interesting about the bribery corruption case was not only that it never went to trial, of course, everyone pled guilty mm-hmm. um, with minimal fines, minimal jail time, prison time, but also um, you never got to find out answers to all these questions like, were there executives in Seattle taking bribes that were six or seven figures? Um, if, you, if you look through the indictment and you go through a lot of the other anecdotal info out there, yeah, of course that was going on. What about all these guys like... So this is coming out of China, especially right now, um, that, that oh, they're God. doing the, like <laughs> mirroring and shadow shadowing accounts and they're doing all this crazy stuff. Does Amazon have enforcement teams that are going after after that mm-hmm. as well? Or is that just way they got to wait for someone to abuse? You know, there's Vine, Vine review abuse going on right now. One of the strategies is uh, <clears throat> for a while is, you know, oh, send in tif- 10 different accounts, mm-hmm. 10 different products of the same product and put them under different ASINs. Get review thirty reviews on each, and then merge them together. Merge them together, one. or shiny sellers, uh, especially that have ten accounts and nine of them are burner accounts, mm-hmm. and the the last one is the main account they keep squeaky clean. Big problem. What is Amazon doing on those fronts? Are are they proactively trying to take steps? You would think they could flag these things pretty easily. They don't you have can, the you automation. Can look at a review place. and see if it's Vine merge yeah. because it's got seven different UPC codes on it. I mean, uh, it, it, it's yeah. easy to spot. It is. And maybe they don't have the tools, technology. They, they definitely could. They're a technology company, or if they want to call themselves a tech company, they could devote sufficient engineering resources. I mean, they're doing and, AWS on NFL games where they can tell you freaking something in the moment. I mean, they uh, like Good this example. guy just ran this speed and, you know, whatever. I, know. I mean, they can do it if they want to do it. They can do it if they, I mean, it's a trillion and a half dollar company. They can do it. They can do it anyway. It's not like the technology doesn't exist. If they, if they have the motivation, they can do it. Um, I think the review harvesting, the, I mean, it it is ridiculous that you can see listings that have been merged where the sixth, seventh, eighth page are reviews for a totally different product. I mean, that's so basic. You would think that they're 
kind of embarrassed by that and they're going to take action on it. The reason so many people are doing it is because enforcement has been light and lax and a lot of people are getting away with murder with that. They are taking action on some of it. If anyone's listening to this and wondering why they're not taking action on more of it, all I can say is use escalation channels because if you're doing low level reporting on that, um, you're incentivizing Amazon to ignore you and you're wasting your time. And it, it, hurts me to say that some people are really organized, put together lots of great spreadsheets and data and screenshots, and they're flushing them down the toilet. They're not using them in a way that gets it in front of the right people. If you send an email into abuse prevention teams, I mean, that's a starting point. And you have to persevere. You can't send one email and say, why aren't they doing anything? They never do anything. I'm going to forget it, and I'm going to give up. If they, If Amazon thinks you're going to give up, after one attempt or even two, let's say, then they'll ignore you because they're hoping you give up because they want you to go away and they don't want to be buried in these. What you have to do is say, no, we're not going away. And if the team that's responsible for this, this is kind of a basic escalation concept for anything you're trying to do, even reinstating suspended accounts. If the people, let's say, sell a performance responsible for this, aren't reviewing it, aren't doing their jobs, go to another team and say, we've already been where we were supposed to do. We did what we were supposed to do. We gave you everything you asked for or everything we know that we're supposed to give you. Nothing happened. No one did anything. Somebody transferred it. They passed the buck. No one audited investigative quality. No one kept their eye on the ball. Everyone just kept going without even noticing that there was a huge gap in enforcement. So go to other teams, go to other executives, go to other people in the company who are responsible for maybe even multiple parts of managing the marketplace and tell them we were forced to go to you because X, Y, Z didn't do what they were supposed to do. That alone is an escalation that would, you know, pay dividends. If of course you go to the second team, they don't take any interest, go, go up another rung on the ladder. Eventually you'll find somebody who's interested that the people who report to them directly or the people who are adjacent to their teams aren't doing a good enough job to make their lives less miserable. And now that's spilling over into them, right? It's kind of like two countries are at war and it's spilling over into a third country. And now that country's life is miserable because the two countries are fighting with each other and it's dragging in a nearby country. Same concept at Amazon. If they are going to have to start reading those escalations, they have to spend time on it they have to see that if they ignore an escalation that it comes back on them negatively, then they're going to be more interested because they're motivated in solving the problem, right? Everyone's motivated to make their lives less miserable. So if they find a way out of it, they're going to go back and try to solve it, you know, at the source. So e-commerce, Chris, when someone calls you in the middle of the night, freaking out, what are some, what are a few of the big things that you help people that are listening deal with? So if they get into this situation, what are three, four, five of the main things that you, you guys are really adept at helping people work through the, and, and solve? Yeah, we can help quickly with identifying the source of the problem. If they're not being clear about why they're suspended, sometimes people get two different messages in their performance notifications about why they're suspended. If they're not able to squeeze it out of account health reps, we help them do that. Um, if they need an escalation just to determine what the hell is going on, we know how to do one of those quickly. Um, It's not so much about rewriting plans of action anymore. I mean, if that's really what's going on and they've done their due diligence and they figured out that their plan of action is where the battle will be fought and it's missing a few things. Yeah, of course, we've done millions of those. We can sit down with them, help them rewrite it, get it in front of the right people, get it solved faster. The difference with us, I think, is that you come to us expecting that it's going to take days instead of weeks to fix or hours instead of days, depending on the nature of it, especially, you know, just coming out of Q4. Um, If it really is something that takes weeks, which I guess occasionally that's the case, you're talking about one or two weeks, not six weeks, not eight weeks. And I want you to call me in the middle of the night. This is a strange thing to say. I would prefer you do that instead of appealing something seven, eight, nine times completely the wrong way and letting six, seven, eight weeks pass waiting to hear back from teams that have no interest in solving it and then calling me and saying, here's my shovel. I dig myself a really deep hole and now I want you to dig out. Um, Bother me early in the process, (laughs) whether it's a phone call or an email. 
show us, even if you don't hire us to take over everything initially, show us what's going on, get a quick assessment. We've been through everything that could possibly be going on under the sun thousands of times. I can give you a quickie assessment of these are your choices. If you're deciding to handle it yourself, then fine. You're making a conscious business decision to handle something yourself and you just need some coaching and suggestions and advice. We won't take it personally if you don't want it, bring us in. But don't say, I want to handle it myself, send in six or seven terrible appeals, and then call out for help and say, well, I changed my mind now that I've been final worded, now that Amazon doesn't take me seriously, now I want Chris to fix me. I might be able to fix you, but why not involve us early in the process where we can at least give you your options? You know, um, One good thing about, again, coming out of Q4 and being into early 2024, one of the great things about Q4 is that so much is on the line and the typical client we have is selling so many thousands per day of each ASIN or on their account that they, they bring us in earlier in the process because they are losing so much money and they are afraid that Amazon is drowning in appeals. I mean, everyone appeals twice as often, twice as many issues in Q4, right? <clears throat> that kind of makes it more likely that your appeal will be lost and misplaced and confused and Amazon's very disorganized and inconsistent, right? So at least the good thing about Q4 is that people kind of hand us the keys to drive a little earlier in the process. But think about the value in doing that year round, not just in Q4, because Amazon won't take you seriously. If you go to them and you send them an appeal and they look at it and within two seconds, they realize you're guessing or you don't know what's going on or you're getting advice from somebody who's guessing and doesn't know what's going on. They're not going to bother reading it, right? You're disincentivizing them from taking you seriously, which means they're not going to spend time on the appeal. So that's kind of one middle of the night call is, you know, make sure your damage assessment fits and makes sense before you start hastily planning how you're going to fix it. So when I call you, what am I, what should I be, depending on the case, is it yeah. a simple thing as as low as 500 bucks and a complex thing as five or 10 grand or what's a, what's a yeah, range? Not 10 grand, closer to five. If you're, that's, that's our full project rate in terms of priority hiring us to take over. Um, okay. 500 bucks. Yeah. We have one hour consults for this is, you know, interpretive services, strategic assistance. This is what's going on. Figure out if you want to write an appeal. If you do want to write an appeal, consider putting these things into it. The initial information is just show me the performance notification, which is the messaging Amazon sent you mm -hmm. when they announced the restriction or announced the deactivation. Um, if you've already appealed it, show me that. If you've already called account health to figure out what the hell is going on or why your appeal was rejected, tell me what they told you. Make sure you push them for rejection reasons or denial notes, not just some generic story that they give everyone when people call. So those three things, that's the best place to start. A fourth question would be, is this the first time you've been suspended for XYZ? Is this the first time your ASIN's gone down for XYZ? Because if it's a recurring problem, then obviously that impacts your strategy. If it's the fourth time it's happened, you know, maybe something's going on <laughs> that you need to address operationally. So those, those are the key pieces for what we start with. Um, and then, yeah, we believe in self-determination. If it's something you think you can appeal and you've appealed it successfully before, maybe you can use some components of a previous appeal now. Don't assume it's the same exact thing. Make no assumptions. That's, that's another word of caution. Chris, I think we could sit here. We've been going at this for over an hour. I yeah. think we could sit here probably and talk about this for quite some time. There's so many aspects and avenues to go down. But uh, if someone wants to uh, uh, reach out and, and consult with you guys or hire you if they got a problem yep. um, or to get ahead of a problem, what's the best way to do that? Yep. So our intake form, our inbox is support, S-U-P-P-O-R-T at ecommercechris.com. Um, that's a great place to send us copies of suspension notifications. You wrote an appeal. You want to take a quick look at it, uh, send it there. Um, I don't recommend people send us mountains of attachments. It's usually better to just show us the initial basic info and then we can tell you what we want to view from there. Um, but yeah, I mean, what we are known for, not just escalation strategy and high level strategies, we're also known for being responsive and for being attentive to uh, the urgency, because we've seen all those nightmares. We've seen the train wrecks. And even if you don't end up hiring us to fix something, I'd rather just know the nature of your situation 
and keep you away from bad decisions early in the process so that you can go make an informed decision. And there's nothing wrong with just running stuff by us quickly. We're happy to help, especially if you're a frequent listener of the AM PM podcast. <laughs> That's a good thing to put in the subject line of an email. You know, maybe I'm a bit of a traditionalist. People do message me on WhatsApp and so forth, but um, email is a great way to start because you can put something like that in a subject line, account suspended, frequent listener, AM, PM. I know that I need to get eyes on that contact quickly and respond. You know, if I can't respond right away within a couple of hours or at least before the end of that business day. Awesome, yeah. Chris. So support at ecom chris.com mm-hmm. is the best way to reach out to him. Chris, uh, looking forward to maybe uh, seeing you in May at the Billion Dollar Seller Summit and yes, uh, or at uh, another event out there somewhere. Our really event. appreciate you taking time. Seller Velocity Conference. That's right. Yep. Seller Velocity. When is that? When's the dates on that one? Uh, May 1st and May 2nd, New York City. I'll, I'll May be, 1st uh, and 2nd yeah. in New York City. Um, so check Seller Velocity, May 1st and May 2nd yep. in New York City's uh, Chris's event that he's doing, which is going to be, uh, you got a pretty good uh, lineup of people coming to that, right? Yep. Yep. Bradley. Yep. Hooray. They, they all right. Yep, Bradley's one. Gonna- <laughs> um, and uh, Leah McHugh speaking. She works with us on, she does types of consulting no one does, which should be of interest in terms of brand registry, troubleshooting, listing and compliance, product and safety compliance. A lot of things that sellers assume they understand, maybe don't always understand. Um, Emma Schirmer Tamir, listing optimization. And um, Janelle Page is going to be our, our MC. So um, everyone knows how wonderful and. <laughs> Janelle is the MC. She's speaking She's in Hawaii best. too. Mm-hmm. She's a hoot. So here is an MC is going to, that's going to be, uh, everybody kick off their shoes and going to have some fun. Awesome. The energy is going to be good. Can't wait. Awesome. I can't wait, Chris. Appreciate it, man. So much to know when it comes to what's allowed, what's not allowed on Amazon, how to deal with it when you've either done something you shouldn't have or maybe you haven't. Maybe a competitor's uh, reported you for something. Uh, That's great information from Chris. Be sure to check out e-commerce Chris. Support at ecommercechris.com. If you've got any problems with your account, uh, day or night, they can help you out. Great guys over there at that company. Got another really killer episode coming next week with someone that's is a billionaire, actually has sold crazy amounts of companies. It's just a a serial entrepreneur in products and digital stuff. It's going to be an awesome episode. Anybody that's an entrepreneur does not want to miss this episode. I mean, some great stuff on mindset, on how building teams and a whole bunch of cool stuff. So don't miss next week's episode. Before we do that, I've got some words of wisdom for you. This is a filter that I use sometimes when uh, making decisions. I always ask myself, how much can I influence the outcome after the initial choice is made? How much can I influence the outcome after the initial choice is made? Have a great week. We'll see you again soon.